Today on Sagittarian Matters, gay amazing race, butch hair quarantine, advice, karaoke, and more with friend to the show and very special guest, Dr. Karen Tonkson. Stay tuned. Sagittarian Matters, Sagittarian Matters, what's the Karen Tongson is Professor of English, Gender, and Sexuality Studies and American Studies and Ethnicity at USC. You may know her as the Lambda Award-winning author of Why Karen Carpenter Matters, as an originator of Butch Hair Quarantine, and as one half of the podcast Waiting to Exhale. You can hear me talk about the amazing race with Karen on our upcoming podcast, the limited series The Gay Amazing Race, premiering later this month. Now please enjoy my talk with friend to the show, and Virgo, Dr. Karen Tonkson. Karen Tonkson, welcome back to Sagittarian Matters. Hello, Nicole. I'm very happy to be back. Now, I have actually been speaking to you I've been using the Sagittarian Matters social distancing studio for a different purpose, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, but we have been doing a lot of Zooming for the gay amazing race. We've been Zooming in a very breakneck fashion, not unlike the amazing race itself, which, you know, proceeds very quickly and each leg is just back to back to back. It's felt like a bit of a mega leg as they call it on The Amazing Race. I have to tell you, I've had two Amazing Race dreams since we started the podcast. Oh, wow. Really? One of them last night, the cha- that I had a challenge last night that was like involved putting a turtle in a turtle tank, but you had to clean it and you had to set up the light and there was bleach involved and there were all these different components and there were no instructions. So you had to figure out the order without killing the turtle. It was really stressful. That is really stressful. I feel like I may have had a, a, a task-oriented Amazing Race dream as well. I mean, the thing is, there's I'm also having residual content, Amazing Race content in my dreams because uh, lately to relax before bed, uh, I've been watching old Amazing Race episodes in part just to keep my mind fresh for the game Amazing Race. And I just finished season 18 uh, recently. <laughs> I've just been going through, I've been hopping around the Amazing Race universe. Anyway, yes, um, very much so. We've been like in each other's virtual spaces, head spaces, gay Amazing Race spaces. So uh, it's really nice to just kind of hang out. Uh, I don't know, just to hang out differently, even if we have the same Zoom rooms that we're Zooming from. Karen, it's possible the last time I saw you was New Year's Eve. 2020, when I was at your house making lemon pigs at the New Year's party. That's possible. That's the last time I saw you. Maybe I saw you in between then and March, but I'm not sure. I did see you shortly before Super Tuesday, which was March 6th in California. I believe we were at our pal Sarah Gertrude Shapiro's place. Um, I can't remember if it was for a birthday or whose birthday it was. I just remember having a chance to sit beneath the citrus trees. And of course, we talked about the amazing race there also. Yes. Well, I'm happy to see you now, but I want to back up and I want you to tell me how your pandemic has gone. What have your waves of the pandemic been? And then I want to segue into butch hair. Oh, yeah. Pandemic. And uh, I'm wearing a hat right now. So that should indicate where my butch hair is. But uh you know, the pandemic waves have been pretty intense. Even when I last physically saw you in person around March 6th, I was already in the excessive hand washing and surface sanitizing mode because I took it pretty seriously pretty early on. And, you know, it's interesting for me to reflect back on how much has changed about our knowledge of coronavirus since then, because I thought it was primarily a surface thing. So I just thought that if I didn't touch certain things or just kept my hands super clean or whatever, I guess maybe that was my Virgoan, like obsessive compulsive, <laughs> like response, first response to it. <clears throat> and I remember even when I voted on Super Tuesday, 
I, you know, I wiped down the screen. I was carrying Clorox wipes with me all over the place, right? Uh, and then it was <clears throat> hard lockdown. So the hard lockdown phase of it for all of us, I believe, and at least most of my circle in LA, nobody ignored it. Um, you know, we didn't see anybody. We didn't socially distance hang out with anyone outside. Uh, it was weeks before anyone even came by to drop a puzzle off or do something like that. And to do so outside with us just waving through the glass, you know, like basically no, no contact. I would be terrified when an unmasked jogger jogged past me. Uh, I know that you had your own uh, sort of viral moments vis-a-vis yes, uh, -vis yes. the unmasked jogger. And I was very much, I was very hypervigilant. And I also started therapy in the first phase of the pandemic. I met my new therapist, now not so new therapist in the very beginning. And so I undertook this journey really. Uh, and it's weird because the last tarot reading I had leading up to, uh, you know, our lockdown was in February with the Oracle of LA and I drew the hermit card. <laughs> I'm just like, everyone, <laughs> everyone must have drawn the hermit card. <laughs> like, but, but it was like, she's like, well, this is gonna be really, I don't know, you're really facing this time of reflection and contemplation. <laughs> and so I did that. And also I, I took up meditation. Like I have meditated now for nearly 300 days consecutively. So 288 days. Oh, wow. I started it about a week after, and I have uh, an online guru who I love on Glow. Her name is Joe Tastula. So like, you know, I, I went through all of these different things. At the same time, I also had to resume work, right? And keep working. So um, when I had the tarot reading, I was told to reflect on what it was that I truly wanted to bring into the world. So again, this is pre-lockdown, pre our sense of the seriousness of this virus. And then, you know, I've really taken that to heart through all the many phases of the pandemic. I sound so hippy dippy right now. I mean, maybe I sound very different than maybe I have before even because I'm just so busy going, going, going. And this was a real opportunity for me to do that. And, you know, whatever. I, I think that I, I feel like I live in the hatch on Lost. Mm-hmm every day kind of feels like that and now as we're swinging back to being the worst place in the worst country <laughs> I mean and being the, the worst off uh, I love Los Angeles uh, you know but uh we're the the purplest I don't even know what color that is anymore it's like it's not even red anymore it's like it's beyond red yeah it's like maroon or magenta what who knows and now I feel a swinging back to an even deeper lockdown and sense of isolation because there was a period in the middle there where, you know, there was social distance hanging out, always with masks, always outdoors, or where like we'd, we'd you know, go to big pools, just us and two other people, and we'd be like on opposite ends of the pool from each other. And I feel like that's all, not just because of weather-wise, but that's all pretty much gone because of how dire things are. And so now I'm, I'm re-entering a contemplative phase, but having undertaken some important things and projects and things that give me joy, right? Like Gay Amazing Race and stuff like that. Are you willing to share some of the things that you decided you wanted to focus on bringing into the world? Yeah, I mean, look, I have different and increased roles at my job, my institutional position, my profession. I'm chairing the Department of Gender and Sexuality Studies now. During, like in the beginning of the year, I was promoted to full professor. Like, so there are a lot of things that, you know, were sort of marked where I was in terms of my institutional affiliation and my whatever uh, status at my job. But I realized that those things, those markers at the institution to me mattered less than the creation of community and the you know kind of perpetuation of output and like and justice and all of those different things of world building really and so instead of thinking of those I don't know milestones as the kind of end of you know the end of the project to a certain extent I see it 
see it as a way of bringing my outside world, my way of being in the world, my social world, um, uh, the kind of philosophy that I attend to around, uh, you know, building queer community and that kind of thing. I saw that as an opportunity to try to infuse some of that into, into the institution to make it a kinder place, to also create things that would allow us to interface more directly with the people who we serve or the people who we haven't reached yet. And so I started a podcast network. <laughs> uh, uh, it's really a research group. We got grants for a research group. And then when the pandemic hit, I was like, we can't gather, we can't talk to each other. We're gonna have to do this all online. What if we took, what if, what if I can apply the experience that I've had to doing podcasts and things like that to, and, and, and help some of my colleagues tell their stories, tell stories about the work that they're doing in ways that reach broader audiences and broader public. So I started the Consortium for Gender, Sexuality, Race, and Pop Culture and um, the Gay Amazing Race, which I know I keep like, I, I'm not doing this deliberately, but it keeps looping back to it, yeah. is, is among the podcasts that are in this first phase of this, this really kind of startup network situation that I've got going. Well, this is really exciting. What are some of the other podcasts that are going to be debuting on this network? Well, we had um, we have a podcast. The pilot episode has already aired called "Muslims as Seen on TV" by Evelyn Alsotani, who researches representations of Muslims in the media, and she's a tremendous, tremendous scholar. And she did a, a pilot episode on the Obedi Alsotani test. So Obedi is somebody who um, works actually in the industry and, uh, tries to diversify representation. And so they both kind of went into like, what would, instead of a Bechdel test, how would we forge a test around Muslim representation, especially on TV, because there's been increasing representation, uh, and supposedly more positive representation through the years since 9-11, but a lot has also, I don't know, relies on some of these old tropes. So, so that was great. That episode, um, there's a series uh, almost ready to debut now called Dance Hubs, where Edwin Hill talks about spaces like The Loft and these other kind of community built dance environments and talks to the people who were there, created music there, et cetera, and kind of tells the story of these different communities and scenes um, as a series of hubs in different parts of the world. So that's so that's another one. And of course, uh, there's the Gay Amazing Race. There's also a bunch of other one-off series that are coming out, but it's been, so, I mean, so there's just that. I've been doing Waiting to Exhale and I've been writing some. I published a few <laughs> pieces this year and I started reworking on another book. Um, so I don't know, whatever. I've been trying to do all that and try to put my anxiety at bay and, and contribute where I can to other people and causes and that kind of thing. I'm so happy that you've been doing that. I really, I'm appreciating everything that you're putting into the world. One of the things that you put into the world, you have, you've handed it off, but can we talk about the part of quarantine where every butch person I know who goes to a barber regularly was seeing themselves turn into Rapunzel before their very <laughs> eyes. Yeah, I mean, gosh, you know what I've been also learning to do in just a broader sense is just to indulge my whimsy, indulge my flights of fancy, right? Why not? Like we're confined to these spaces. And I realize I used to do that as a kid all the time, right? Especially those of us without a lot of money or resources, what have you, like you had to do a lot with what you had, including just a single room or something. And so just like you indulged your flights of fancy. So one day I was like chatting with my friend Raquel Gutierrez and some other folks, you know, via text. And I was like, wouldn't it be hilarious to start like a, an Instagram, like documenting how our hair, butch hair is growing out during the pandemic? Because I mean, because actually I'll take my hat off for you now. You can see I'm wearing a hat because I'm very uncomfortable with what I call my Minnelli's or like this, <laughs> this shaggy part here that like kind of points, it it's looks like very elfin and it can get very Pete Wentz from a uh, fallout boy or whatever band it was. It's, it's like your sideburns kind of, it's, it's like yeah. the hair that grows there. But it's like it can easily flip from being a sideburn, which is a little more mask, to a Minnelli, which is not <laughs> yeah. <laughs> named after Liza Minnelli, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah. Those of you youngsters who don't know. Anyway, 
Yeah. So, uh, so I, I just started an on a lark, but hair quarantine uh, on Instagram. I selected a picture of Lou Diamond Phillips and Young Guns as the photo because people used to tell me when I was in high school when I did have long hair that I looked like Lou Diamond Phillips in oh, wow. Young Guns. <laughs> so thought what a good avatar. And then, uh, and then I just basically got my friends to start volunteering some of their grow out or their efforts at home haircuts because that was mm. the other side of things. And then I just started getting a lot of different submissions. And I also tried to, you know, kind of jokingly point out different hair, like funny hair inspirations, like Richard Marx was an early one, right? And um, like, so it, it, it crossed the boundaries of like cis, straight, whatever, like in hair, hair inspirations, you know? Uh, and then, you know, honestly, when, you know, after the death of George Floyd and the kind of uh, the, the, the social and political uh, social justice uprisings of the summer, I was like, okay, <laughs> this is cool. And I do want to continue doing this for us, like documenting our hair, but, but I also want to figure out a way, because I also noticed that a lot of, you know, a lot of submissions came from white butches. Yeah. And, and it was really hard to be you know, to amplify representation, butch representation across the spectrum of races, genders, et cetera. And, and it was mostly white butches who were submitting. And so, so I, I had to kind of pause and rethink and started bringing guest curators in and other folks. And so that's sort of when, you know, and then when other stuff picked up, I just sort of like let it be its own thing. And Jenny Olson has luckily kind of taken up the mantle has been really committed to keeping it going. One thing that you did have on there before the break was you had somebody talk your wife through cutting your hair. <laughs> yes, I had my stylist Madden Lopez. They are also the director of Project Q, which is a great organization here in LA. Um, that services, you know, LGBT youth of color, trans youth, um, especially those experiencing housing insecurity. And they have been cutting my hair now for, since my last stylist um, died, basically, which was in 2012. And so Madden, like, they were like, okay, we can't get together, but I can talk Sarah through helping you with a haircut. And I thought, okay, they're just, you know, they're just going to tell Sarah to like take how to use the buzz clippers or something to, you know, but without buzzing everything off. But it turned out to be a real legit hair tutorial, you know, with shaping and different uses of the scissors. And honestly, that foundational lesson helped Sarah help me cut, have my hair cut throughout the, the whole pandemic. I mean, right now I'm due for one and she knows that and we've done it a couple of times, gotten lazy and just kind of whacked it off like randomly, but, but at least she knows the basic principles. And I think a lot of people were able to pick something up from that. And we raised money for Project Q in the process. Well, I definitely wanted to give Project Q a shout out. Today's episode is brought to you by Nicole Zeller, Emily Helmus, Amy Ranham, Zoe Worth, Laura Perry, Shoshana Ruth Wechter, Christy Harrod, and Joey Soloway. If you would like to support Sagittarian Matters, especially producer Chris Sutton, please send $5, $5 billion via PayPal, that's your business, to hornetleg at gmail.com. That's hornet like the insect, leg like its appendage at gmail. Or, this just in, he's got a Venmo. Hell books on Venmo. H-E double hockey sticks books. Thank you for your support, and we look forward to saying your name on the podcast. Producer Ponyo looks forward to it too. Don't be scared, that's just Ponyo's speaking voice. Dear Sagittarian Matters, I have a friend who I love very much, but I feel like she wants me to tell her everything, which isn't really my style. How can I not feel guilty for this? From guilty in Connecticut. 
Well, Connecticut is a place to feel guilty, I guess. I mean, that's a kind of like <laughs> a place of the best. I may have made up the word Connecticut. <laughs> I could say guilty and Gilroy. Guilty and Gilroy. That. Guilty yeah. and Gilroy would be amazing. It's all the garlic. Anyway, um, you know, here's my bit of advice. I think that it's important for us to convey to the different people in our lives what our varying degrees of intimacy are or what the different role, you know, like not, not every relationship <clears throat> is configured as a one size all, tell everybody everything, uh, this is all or nothing. It's, you know, friendship intimacy is love, but one of the great pleasures of having friendship in intimacy, hopefully in a kind of promiscuous way is that different people share different parts of you. You know, par exemple, you share the amazing race part of me, <laughs> Nicole. Yes. And there may, and maybe a little Phantom of the Opera. Also. Oh, definitely. But, you know, there are other people who I turn to for, let's say, if, if I just want a food porn out with somebody, like, it's often like, if I see something, they're like, oh, I want to eat that, you know, whatever, I'll text Moira Morel, <laughs> right? And, or I'll, you know, or there's certain people who I express my deepest, darkest political fears and feelings to, like, whenever there's a kind of political emotional crisis, I, I reach out to Shapiro or somebody like that, you know, there are different people who serve those different purposes. And I love each and every one of you, but not everybody gets to have every part of me. And I think that that's one thing that this, you know, um, guilty in Gilroy <laughs> or Connecticut, wherever you are can say to the person, whoever that is, like address their specificity, address who they are and who you are in relation to them and, and work with that as opposed to thinking there's some blanket way of being intimate with somebody. I think that's really valuable. And one of the things that I think that advice touches on is this person isn't doing anything wrong just because their friend wants something different. And I think that that's an important thing that is sometimes hard to remember. You're not doing something wrong. You don't have to tell every person everything. That's not that's not the requirement for you being a friend. That's not the requirement for you having companionship on this planet. So you can have boundaries with this person. You can have this honest conversation with them, but also as you go forth, you don't always have to share when you're making a boundary with somebody. You could just have it. Like Karen, you don't like go to Moira and you're like, Moira, just so you know, here's the things <laughs> I'm not telling you. <laughs> Exactly. Right. <laughs> You're just like emphasizing. These are the things I love talking to you about. Yeah. Or that's, or you just exist in the things that you love talking to each other about. Right. You know, and so if I want to talk to other people about other things, you know, and, and that's, I think that that's also the healthy foundation for a romantic relationship because, you know, the, just the understanding that different people, you know, fulfill different aspects of, you know, one's broad and intimate needs are you know it's it's just like that's a great place to start from because the idea that one person whether it's a friend or a lover must and can have everything or all of you as much as the song so many songs tell us is that that's, it's just not particularly good or healthy it's it's nice for you to have different baskets Absolutely. different baskets to hold different parts of you um, and you know, you do get to be an integrated person, but still mm -hmm. you get to have, have a variety. Dear Sagittarian Matters, what, and this feels like something that might be either now or post or pre-pandemic, what's the best event to organize or find for building lesbian fam slash community as a 40 something from <laughs> 40 and I don't want to say 40 in Florida, 40 in Fort Worth. <laughs> 40 in Fort Worth. I believe, isn't there a, a venerable lesbian bar called Sue Ellen's in Fort Worth? Anyway, um, let's see. You know, the answers I think might be slightly different. Look, I'm a very food motivated person in any sort of conviviality that I've enjoyed or experienced involves food and drink. And now you don't have to drink alcohol. And the food and what variety of food you're doing is up to you. Um, but, you know, one of the things that the pandemic 
has curtailed is all of us breaking bread, sharing victual, as they would say, you know, um, because of the various forms of transmission, et cetera. But, but in terms of building community, I think that it's, it's a good starting point. And even if what you're doing is talking about that, right? Talking about food or sharing recipes, because what, they, what, what food does, what food and drink do is it opens up a way of reflecting on your histories, your past of times that you shared with people. Mm-hmm. And you get to be in the headspace of talking about people, right? And so I think that that's a good spot, um, a good thing to in, in, encourage conviviality, uh, you know, whatever in whatever forms. But, you know, I think like also building community over 40, uh, I've found that I've been increasingly doing gentle outdoor things. That's that's partly pandemic, but also because I think that we can't stay up as long <laughs> late at night. And sometimes the daylight hours are good, get some vitamin D, also get a little movement, our metabolism slow down. So, you know, a walk in the park, uh, you know, a hike together, like those sorts of things that I really just was not super into, even though I did them begrudgingly in my 20s. Um, doing things like that, figuring out ways to get outside with each other. Um, And, you know, I mean, I've always enjoyed different forms of like playing games and whatever. Like, you know, somebody, a friend of mine just started um, kind of inviting us for these Zoom game nights where, you know, we'd like have a separate tablet with like a game on it, whether or not it's like Catan or uh, Clue or something. And so we're on the Zoom and we play games together. Some of us ordered, you know, drinks and food in or whatever. And it's a mix of like having a task uh, to do so that we're not just staring at each other on Zoom awkwardly. Uh, and and it, it's it's a, an effective way of distributing your attention across screens and what have you. So I think that those are all pretty good places to start. I don't know if this person's asking about like, I mean, building communities, building community, whereas like, I don't know, hitting on like, or like trying to find people to date is a different story. Yeah. For me, events to organize or find for building community at any age has always been volunteering, just finding something that you are passionate about and making yourself available to them. For me, that's how I've always found people that were like-minded in ways that felt really valuable to me. So, I mean, you know, I love rock and roll camp for girls. I love any kind of social justice thing. And you're going to find lesbians oh, when yeah. you get towards the closer you get to social justice of any sort, the closer you are to lesbians. You don't even yeah. need to worry about it. You don't even need to think about it. They're just there. It's true. It's you may true. not see them all at first, but they're there. Yeah. And I would also advocate not just eating and drinking, but also cooking, cooking together when Karen, the opportunity presents itself. I want to tell you something, which is that. Recently, we've been watching Chopped. You know, it's always there. We've just been revisiting it. And I think as an extended thing for Kaya's birthday, I'm going to have virtual Chopped with (gasps) a a couple of her friends where I drop off the weird ingredients. Yes. And then we we do it. And they all have to have a partner or somebody in their home who can be the taster and also the minder. Oh, yeah. That sounds amazing. If you ever do another version of that again, I would love to do that. I've always wanted to, I've been wanting to, my friend Amith and I have talked about doing um, just like before the pandemic an in-person chopped and we just, you know, we just never got together, always too busy. Also like the, the logistics of separate kitchens, right? And now that we know how to like beam into each other's kitchens using cameras, Uh, We lay people know how to do that now. That's great. But yes, for sure. My one thing about Chopped, I will say, Mm -hmm. is both Chopped, and I've said this on multiple podcasts, but I'm going to reiterate it here. Someday, maybe I'll write about it. Chopped and Top Chef and many cooking competition shows are the place where you will find butch representation on Mm. television. Please tell me more. You'll notice uh, if you've like been mainlining episodes of Chopped or or even, you know, Guys Grocery Games or, but especially Top Chef, that's where kind of like their elite sort of uh, chefs and lesbians, many butch who have like emerged as like, you know, kind of uh, luminaries in the, the lesbianic world or in the, in the queer world. 
as a result of their appearances there. And I think that in the chef world, there is like, you know, even though in many respects, it's can be deeply misogynistic, um, deeply patriarchal, uh, there are a lot of butch dykes, I think, who've been drawn to some of the different forms of community that have built there. And also the kind of tatted up, like gonzo rock and roll lifestyle of chefing. And so you see on Chopped and on Top Chef, I think your greatest and widest range of butch representation on television. So people in the pandemic, if you're looking for even virtual community to pretend like you're friends with these people, just tune in to food shows. And for people who don't know, you must know, but Chopped is a show on the Food Network where three chefs, sometimes they're home chefs, sometimes they're professionals, they get a basket with disgust, like just like weird ingredients, disparate ingredients, incompatible, like incompatible, like gummy worms, beet liqueur and beef tongue. (laughs) Yeah. And then it's like, okay, chefs, you have 20 minutes to make an appetizer. And then there's a different (laughs) shitty basket for the main course. And then there's a different basket for the dessert course, but these are all judged as if they are real. Like the judges are like, Oh, I want to know if I would eat this at a restaurant. I want to see the plating. I want to see the creativity. And I want to see, you know, like, oh, I could really taste the gummy bear reduction in your, you know, beef tongue tartar, yeah. uh, like deconstructed graham cracker, um, <laughs> de- deconstructed s'more. Like, it's- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have to say, though, this is like uh, an addendum to, you know, if you do binge chopped. I have to say that like just being in the headspace of watching people improvise with different ingredients has, I think, made me a better cook. At me home. too. Has it? I feel yeah, like because I you're play like, I could do this can of garbanzo beans, you know, one lemon and like whatever, like, uh, you know, uh, cashew cheese or something. I mean, that would be a gift. The things you just said would be like, <laughs> a, that would be like somebody, I knew somebody on the production team that was offering Grape me. Grape jelly. Like, <laughs> But I will play chopped with myself. So if you're like looking in your cupboard and you have weird ingredients, you just sit with yourself. And like some things that I have done, there's there's a car- food cart in Portland called Potato Champion. That's a French fry cart. And they had peanut butter, they had PB&J fries, which was Whoa. fries with a peanut satay sauce. And then like a spicy kind of raspberry jam situation on oh, top. They probably yeah. called it something that wasn't jam. They probably called it a different word for sauce. But I think about that. I mean, I like to think about just different combinations of things. And I'm like, okay, how can I use that concept at home with what I have here? Yeah, for sure. Um, Yeah, so there you go. Like, I mean, that's the thing is, one thing that I also want to say is, is don't be so hard on yourself during this pandemic. You know, just also like, I don't want to come off as like, one of those assholes, like, cause I was just like, I've just been taking the time to meditate and find myself <laughs> and, you know, create podcast networks and write a bunch of shit. Look, there's a lot of despair and hand wringing and just like sadness and all, you know, like, you know, I'm, I'm focusing on the things that I'm taking out of it with positivity. Cause we've just hit the new year, but I will say like, even in some of your darkest times or what you think of as your most fallow moments, i.e., mainlining 30 episodes of Chopped, like within a day and a half, (laughs) there's something that will come out of it. Like Ah. you, you know, there's something Mm -hmm. that you can bring it like, like it, it helps, it helped both of us become better cooks, right? To, to, to like be in a headspace of doing that, or, you know, finally getting into the Guy Fieri universe or whatever, like brought me to, you know, brought attention to the different sort of Um, you know, forms of community and justice work that he's been doing for the restaurant community during this pandemic, right? Like, so, you know, like, that's the thing. Don't be hard on yourself. Don't think you're being fallow. Don't think you're being lazy. There's something that you're getting from that experience, right? It's very like Mr. Miyagi, wax on, wax off. You think you're just cleaning a car. Well, guess what? You're learning karate. So there you go. Happy pandemic. (laughs) Dear Sagittarian Matters, what are three films baby queers must see? I'm wondering if this is means older films or if it just means films in general or if it means queer films. Do you think the happiest season's at t- number one for both of us? <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Don't do it. <laughs> I mean, I think it's worth a peek. You know, honestly, I think that it's important 
to watch some of those early new queer cinema films. Mm. So, you know, Go Fish, uh, Watermelon Woman, you know, those films made 25 years ago, The Incredibly True Adventures of Two Girls in Love, you know, uh, I think it's important to see how people at, at the precipice at this moment where I think that we were beginning to really discuss queerness queer discourse, queer relationships in a broader media sphere. You know, I think of the 90s in that way. I think that it's important to look at the kind of, uh, you know, what was being made then and to learn your new queer cinema because it's also just like people are, you know, people seem to be acting like every time there's a new lesbian character or lesbian characters in a film that that's never happened before. And there's this constant reinvention of the wheel. And, you know, so that's why I would encourage looking at those, you know, out filmmakers, many of whom are still making, making movies today, who are starring in things today, who are writing. Uh, you have Guinevere Turner, you know, who just made that incredible uh, film, Charlie Says, uh, with Mary Heron. You have um, Cheryl Dunye, who's been, who directed episodes of Lovecraft Country, who's been directing tremendous TV, who's been doing Queen Sugar, things like that, who's been... Yeah, just uh, you, you, you see the different styles. A lot of those directors, a lot of those creators, Rose Trochet, et cetera, who are making those uh, new queer cinema films in the 90s uh, are making the media that you're consuming today, especially on television, especially, you know, peak TV. So I highly recommend getting into that stuff and knowing what that was all about. I think that's really valuable. I do want... I want baby queers to cultivate a sense of humor. And so I do want to recommend some John Waters. I do think there are moments that are problematic. So you can unpack those with your friend who you watch it with. Uh, thing, you know, things from the late 60s and 70s and 80s and beyond. But I, I do I do want there to be an infusion of humor too. Because I, you know, like the, incred the incredibly true story of two girls in love was such an important movie for me. But also at the same time, I loved Desperate Living. And there were parts about it that made me uncomfortable that still make me uncomfortable in a way that's not like, cool, so squeaky. But um, <laughs> yeah. there are, there are, I, I want to, what is another way you think people could tap into kind of like, like a gay camp sensibility of like, okay. Yeah, I mean, but just part of it is just allowing yourself to have a gay camp sensibility, right? Or to find like pleasure in things that are problematic, honestly, you know, to be able to interrogate your pleasure and to think about like, why is it that I'm so attached to this? This is part of what my entire intellectual life, my ent entire relationship to kind of critical theory to media analysis is, is bound to this idea of disidentification, right? You know, Jose Munoz's great classic book about, you know, watching Carmelita Tropicana you know, engage with the Chiquita Banana, like, stereotype. Uh, Margaret Gomez and I Feel Pretty, right? Like, you know, uh, pretty witty and gay, right? And why, you know, engaging in, like, that that thing that, like, the representation of, you know, Puerto Ricans in, uh, in West Side Story, or what have you. Just think about, like, well, okay, let's think about, like, why am I hailed by that? Why am I attached to that? And how can I turn that or twist that or find pleasure in it or transpose that into something usually camp is the method but there are other ways of doing it right so so i mean instead of thinking that just because something presents a problematic representation or something that's not ideal that it has to be canceled or thrown out you know it's just like well why does that that call to me you know and what is it that i carry into the way that i imagine life now that is touched by that Saeed Jones does that too in his amazing uh, memoir, right? So that's all I have to say, you know, around like, I don't know, what could you watch for camp? Like Barbarella, you know? <laughs> I mean, watch something like that. Like, or there's a lot of 70s lesbian exploitation, less exploitation uh, films. Uh, Michelle uh, Johnson, who is a music supervisor now, uh, like cut together this amazing super edit of... Uh, like, you know, these Italian lesbian vampire movies and things like that. I would suggest like seeking that out, Vampiros Lesbos, things like that. 
uh, and just, you know, whatever, indulging in some of that, the hunger, even that's more easily accessible, right? It's a drama, but it's campy, but it's what, or, or like, why did you like fried green tomatoes, even though like, you know, or boys on the side, like to get even closer historically, right? Yes, it has like, you know, the unrequited love, like, why are we attached to those narratives? And what carries over in that? You know, what did we have to say about Whoopi Goldberg being into, you know, Mary Louise Parker, who seems to be like the, the favorite, like, non-lesbian, lesbian actress out there, right? Anyway. Hi, listeners, it's me, Nicole. If you would like to support me and Ponyo, in particular, our comics and animal illustrations, go to patreon.com slash Nicole J. Georges. And for as little as $2 a month, you can have access to hundreds of pages of otherwise unpublished diary comics. For the price of one cold brew plus tip, you can become an honorary Sagittarian. And for the price of two vegan cupcakes or two vegan donuts, you can become a Ponyo's Friend Club member, at which point you really start raking in goods, including new buttons. Check it out. Patreon.com slash Nicole J. Georges. One more question from a listener before we get to talk about the gay amazing race. Cool. Dear Sagittarius Matters, what are some of your favorite karaoke apps? I received a couple amazing ones for Christmas and I didn't even know they existed. I want some, an overview or recommendations for this pandemic version of togetherness. <laughs> so Karen, we did karaoke together before the pandemic. We each it's have true, had for different- your birthday. <laughs> oh, for my birthday, for my birthday. And now I have done karaoke during the pandemic, but I actually have done karaoke in a field with Kaya's parents with their karaoke machine set up and like our chairs very far apart with separate microphones. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've done a couple of online karaoke things once on Zoom. That was a little bit more difficult, but I mean, what doing online karaoke that maybe the apps do, and I will tell you right now, I've only used a karaoke app once and that's the um, Mule or Spule Sing app from like, I want to say five or six years ago. So it was an early app. And the thing about that app is that what it does is it pairs you with just a stranger somewhere else in the world and you can sing a duet. Oh my God. So, yeah. So talk about like, you know, whatever, uh, having, uh, I don't know, a, a real community building experience. You, uh, I did this with a friend who sang uh, that Bruno Mars ballad, um, should have bought you flowers or whatever that, you mm -hmm. know, um, uh, which she used to always sing karaoke. And then she just sang it with someone who was in Korea or something like that. And it was so cute. We were just like sitting at her dining table while she was doing this song with somebody else. You could do it on your phone. Mm -hmm. But that said, I'm not a big app person when it comes to karaoke. So uh, I don't have any advice to give or, or like, you know, rankings to give based on that. Um, there is a secret, secret karaoke virtual space that a friend of mine, I, I don't even want to share what it is because like, I think that we're not supposed to be using it. Um, it's based in another country. <laughs> But that's fun because it makes it look like you're actually in a private karaoke room and you can move beers around and play a cowbell and and you can use YouTube videos and then it projects onto a screen inside the virtual karaoke room. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, you, I'll, you and I should should, you know, visit it at some point. But... Well, visit listeners. I'm so sorry. We're telling you about Fight Club right now. <laughs> I know. I know. But like, but honestly, just, you know, the, the joy of karaoke is just doing it and and like getting to express yourself and hearing others express themselves so it doesn't matter what app it is it's whatever you feel most comfortable with I love people's karaoke voices I love hearing different people sing especially yeah. people who are not singers but also people who are singers yeah for sure Karen now's the time for just a few minutes we get to talk about the amazing race the gay amazing race um, I mean, what do I even say? We have a podcast coming out shortly called The Gay Amazing Race. Sagittarius Matters will still exist. Waiting to Exhale will still exist. This is a limited series. It's a limited series. It's like when Duran Duran split off into the power station in Arcadia very briefly. 
uh, you know, this is maybe our uh, power station project, I guess. Uh, <laughs> you know, just one album, or like Arcadia only made one album. Anyway, as you're saying, it's a limited series because in part because you know we're very very busy people but also i'm so excited the thing that i'm most stoked by is that we get to talk to some of the teens oh my god we've already talked to the very first gay men that were on the amazing race in season one team guido bill and joe yeah. we have talked to oswald from oswald and danny I mean, that is just like, it's so weird because I didn't realize how deep my attachment was to Oswald and Danny, uh, who were the second gay team, but the first uh, gay team of color to be on The Amazing Race. Mm -hmm. And I was just so, and like, in much the same way that when I got to interview the Indigo Girls uh, last spring, that I was so happy because they not only like lived up to my expectations, but exceeded them. Mm -hmm. Talking to Oswald was exactly like that. I'm such a fan. I just like living in LA, you know, sometimes you go to parties where there's a lot of famous people there and you're like, well, look at me, Bay Ping in the city. And I went to a party like this one year, a Christmas party. I swear to God, Karen, I'm telling you this for comparison. Barbara Streisand was at this party, but Mike oh, White God. was there. Um, and I was like, Shh. I was like, I have to tell you, I'm such a big fan. I love watching it. <laughs> like, I don't care. I don't care who's like, I don't, I just was so zoomed in. I'm such a fan. There's like, I'm a fan of comedians and I'm a fan of people from the amazing race. And that's yes. pretty much like my biggest nerddom. I'm so nervous. I'm sweating to talk to you. I could never talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> that's to that's totally how I feel. And I think that that's like one of the things that's one of the things that like, that's why I'm glad that we are like, you know, transposing this into, I don't know, into something. Who knows if anybody else will care? If any other gay people out there love The Amazing Race as, race as much as we do. <laughs> There's like four. <laughs> There's like four maybe, like we might get like four listeners or what have you, but like, but honestly, this is a true labor of love and it's, it's but it's also been fun. It's, I don't know, it's given me the excuse to rewatch whole seasons there's I realize there's little that I there's so much that I don't retain about the specific challenges or places for for the most part so actually re-watching some of these seasons feels so new to me mm. you know so it's sort of like oh, I didn't I didn't remember them having to do this ritual under the waterfall in Japan you know or whatever right uh yeah and it just especially right now when we can't travel we should not travel at least right um it's it's just it's such a delight to see people moving freely in the world. I like watching them move freely in the world and then interact with other people in the world without fear. Like people just breathing on each other, sitting close to each other, doing a dance with each other, like passing an envelope back and forth with someone who they've never <laughs> met before. And no, there's no hand sanitizer to be found. Drinking hundreds of cups of tea, like in <laughs> India, like all together, whilst people who are shoving their noses in it and like, you know, like basically drooling all over the, all the contestants over this giant table of tea. <laughs> and there was, I do this, I have to say, there's one scene that comes me anxiety and that was like when you know it was in the finale episode of season 18 when one of the teams gets into a cab and you hear the cab driver coughing <gasps> and that oh, to no. me I was like oh <laughs> like that that tells you know it's it's just get foreshadowing like the profound forms of PTSD I'm gonna have after all this but yeah I don't know I mean Nicole like I don't know what do you think how do you feel about like I you know how do you feel about doing a podcast about the amazing race finally the gay amazing race I'm so thrilled. I, at some point I was dating somebody who I feel like I just, I wore them out. I it was just like, basically if there was like a bingo card for the many times a day I mentioned the amazing race, it would be a blackout card every day because I just was obsessed with the amazing race. I couldn't stop thinking about it, talking about it. It was my single-minded goal, trying to construct how I could be on the show. Like I just, wanted to watch it all the time. I wanted to talk about it. I wanted to think about strategy. I wanted to read interviews with contestants. And I actually, I had to like back off for a while because it got a little too intense. I had to back off for a while, skip some seasons, but now I'm back and I'm excited to revisit the catalog. I'm excited to get to talk to these people in real life, get some insider insight into what it was like and whether they got produced or kind of had boundaries around production. Yeah. I love hearing all of it. And it's also been an interesting lesson in like 
I don't know, productive stocking, I guess, Mm -hmm. (laughs) because, you know, it's not like a lot of these, these folks aren't in the entertainment industry. So they don't have IMDB pro profiles or anything like that, you know? Um, So that, you know, there's no, like, there's no agent usually, at least some of the earlier contestants. Uh, And so, you know, partly it's like, who knows who we're going to end up getting to talk to. We've been so lucky so far getting to talk to different teams including pat and kate the married ministers the first lesbian out the first out lesbian team on the amazing race and so i don't know so so that's also another thing it's it's also taught me to just be bold and ask people i know know? sagittarian matters is i'm often very nervous to ask people to be on the podcast and then when they say yes i do get a little bit of a high but if i haven't asked anyone to be on the podcast for a while i get that kind of low self-esteem feeling again of like (laughs) oh why would they why would they ever deign to speak to me? <laughs> um, Karen, thank you for coming on Sagittarian Matters. Oh, it's so much fun. I'm so glad to get to do this. And and also, this is, I feel like this is a nice pit stop in between like, you know, the first half of our Game Amazing Race and what will be the second half of our Game Amazing Race. So it's fun to check in and to catch up this way. And uh, yeah, I hope that you... And Kaya, enjoy the rest of your week and your chopped competition as well. Thank you very much. I'll keep you posted and we can definitely do an LA version of this. Yes, for sure. I would love to do this. All right, Karen, people can find you online at Tongsonator on Instagram. Correct. Tongsonator on Instagram at Inland Emperor on Twitter. I started these accounts so long ago that I didn't have the foresight to have them all mesh. <laughs> so at Inland Emperor on Twitter, I tweet a lot uh, and uh, at Tongsonator on Instagram. And you can always look up at Butch Hair Quarantine and follow at Game Amazing Race. Yes. A new Instagram account. Uh, and also that's the same handle for our Twitter account. So follow us on both platforms. And they can also listen to you regularly on Waiting to Exhale. Absolutely. Waiting to exhale. Um, and you can go to waiting to exhale pod.com. That's you'll find our link tree there to get to everything that you need our merch store, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, etc. Excellent. Thank you, Karen. Sagittarian matters is produced by Chris Sutton with assistance by Ponyo Georges. Our theme music is composed by Carolyn Pennypacker Riggs of the band Bouquet. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time.